So this is the disappointing thing, how poor politics has gotten in general, where we don't see good people going for politics anymore. I mean, you used to have pre-selections where 20 candidates would go for a pre-selection. You'd have ex-Supreme Court judges in there. You'd have people who've done 20 years service in lots of other different areas. Now you see even safe seats yeah. for, for both political parties. And you'd have sometimes uh, four candidates, mm, maybe yeah. two candidates. I mean, you look at... Um, some of the safe seats in the, in the Labor Party, for example, like down in Wollongong, Cunningham, they had two candidates. One got told to pull out, so it was a one-horse race. How can you have that in a seat where it's a it's a big um, seat that's for the party and it's a guaranteed seat in Parliament? you think you'd have 20, 20, 30 people going for it. And this is what we've seen over many years now is a decline in politics, people becoming less and less interested in it, which is an alarming thing because what it really links back to is... People are losing faith in the system. People are losing faith in uh, our government, but they're losing faith in the whole of our system, yeah. which is a dramatic and very frightening thing because if you see what that then pushes towards, mm. it pushes towards foreign entities coming in and capitalising on that for their own gains yeah. and to take over. That's right. Just having a class of professional politicians. I mean, we've, we've got this... It's, it's a phenomenon that's been in Australia. It's been building for over 20 years. Uh, people whose only job was ever working in the party. They've never run a business. They've never uh, made a contribution to a profession. They start working in the party, maybe at university or just out of university, and they just become a party apparatchik. And one of the problems, and this is both for Labor and Liberal, is that the factional, the factional hatreds are so fierce now that every faction wants to make sure that whoever it gets in is going to be 100% loyal to that faction. And you can never guarantee that with an outsider. You can never guarantee that with someone who may have, say, spent 20 years working in the railways and wants to make a contribution. You, you, you can't. And so what do they do? They go for people who they can trust. That, that, that is can party flunkies. Exactly. Yeah. People they can trust, people they know. And you wind up with a whole bunch of people uh, representing Australians with just no good life experience and that's exactly where we're at we saw uh elon uh say that um he would be part of a government efficiency um mm. you know board or whatever to to help um, we need him here we well, have more tell you wastage what, in Australia, bureaucracy than anywhere else i think i agree and that's why we have higher tax rates and all the rest of it but i think if you just gave the country to a a founder a startup founder an entrepreneur that had bootstrapped multiple businesses before you watch how efficient this place would run. There would be not a dollar spent uh, where it wasn't meant to be. There would not be a dollar wasted. But they hate those be. people. Look at Trump. Like, he's a businessman. He knows how to run a business. This is why he's hated, because he doesn't have wastage. We have so much wastage, it's ridiculous. Well, it's also bad that he's been in the real world. I mean, this yeah. is the thing we see um, so much disappointingly in politics, is we have people come in there who their only consideration is getting a job for their friend. They don't care about if that person is even suitable for the job, if they've made mistakes in the past or had a terrible, terrible performance uh, at local or state and then they want to go for federal, for example. I mean, you saw Linda Burney come into, what, federal parliament. And she, how long was she in the state parliament? And she was terrible there. Why would you promote her then to a, to a promotion? It makes no sense, but you really have to ask yourself the question, why is this occurring? Why do we not have the good people going for it? And, it's, and it is on all spectrums of politics. I mean, um, one thing I heard John Howard say uh, at a private, um, a private event once was he said, back in his day when he was in politics, you had people come to the Labor Party, for example, who were ex-union, mm. but they had were previously worked in that industry for 20 years. They'd had their hands on the tools. They knew that they, they, they'd done stuff in their life. Mm. And now what you have is you have exactly what is it, the political staff is you have people who have never had a real job and then they expect to just waltz into parliament and then make decisions for millions of people. It simply is a system that doesn't work, which then begs the question, does a set of criteria need to be created for political candidates is, it, is there something that needs to come in where you have a set of standards you must meet like for example i look at the upper house uh let's, let's say the federal upper house or the senate it's meant to be the house of review so that's meant to be the wise experienced politicians that make sure the legislation has all its ducks in a row that hasn't been the case for a long time uh so why wouldn't you put something on the senate a certain age re restriction or that person who's done a lot in their life maybe they're a little bit younger but they've got 
a tremendous amount of experience. Those are the kinds of people you want in the Senate to review legislation, uh, not someone who's young and and not someone who's um, never done anything in their life. Uh, Whose chief great, virtue is absolutely. loyalty. Yeah, yeah that, well, you that, need prerequisites. You actually need a prerequisite to have some sort of a business or have achieved something in your life. And in the Senate, to your point, not only are they not deciding things, some of the times they don't even turn up. You know, you look around the Senate when you're watching it and half the seats are empty. Where are all these senators? Aren't they supposed to be there consistently? I I truly think that, you know, it's a dangerous argument when we start putting rules around who can access democracy. Agreed. Um, It's really really dangerous. What we need is actually more direct democracy. We really do. So that means more citizens initiated referendums, like what we had with The Voice. Wasn't that the best way to slap down, you know, what the government did? Now, did we get the full mileage out of it? No, because our, you know, our, our right-wing side is all over the place. Um, but the idea that the public could say no, 60% said no, and that's it. That is a really powerful thing we could do. We actually need more democracy. If we start adding requirements out of it, we're going to get some selective applications of that, as we've seen with this candidates not having their papers handed in, whereas a lot of the left-wingers are getting their, their candidate papers handed in. And I'm going to have a full analysis of that next week. But... I'm really, really worried about this because what we're seeing is this is going to have an even worse impact. It's the perfect storm on housing because now it's going to tie into the green agenda, more requirements for, you know, people, larger loans, more fat and bureaucrats that don't actually, you know, go to building quality homes. So rather than focusing on a smaller set of trades when building a house, you've also got to consider another five, ten you know, trades because the council's got all these requirements for DAs. I mean, it's slow enough with DAs. If you want a, you know, small extension on the back of your house or just to throw a pool in or a fence, it's a disaster. You're waiting your years and, you know, council are the absolute worst. The amalgamations are the worst thing ever and you know, nothing's getting done. Well, in reality, if you look at it, really, why do we have councils in the first place? It should be handled by the state government. And then if you look at what they have these council elections, it's a huge, huge drain on all the resources uh, for political parties, um, it, it's you just have to ask the question, should we even have councils? Should it go back to being on the state politicians to actually manage their electorates? Obviously, you'd have uh, New South Wales government component uh, that would be do the, do the duties of what the council currently do. But what have councils evolved into? They used to be about well, what, roads, rubbish... R- roads rate rubbish. Yeah, yeah, roads rate rubbish. And now what it's become into ideology. Mm. They're pushing ideology, mm. what books can be at school. Uh, yeah, we have the, uh, mm. very proud to tell everybody here that we have the no more racism signs in our. Oh, so does area. Double Bay. <laughs> and I've got to say, my taxes have gone to pay for that sign because I need to be reminded no, to not be racist. I live in Granville and uh, I mean, 80, 90% are ethnic. So <laughs> well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's just. Insane. So did it help you or you know, <laughs> no. you, you right-wing fascist, Julian? <laughs> Maybe it's something for children to read, you know, because of the nap plan, you know, they don't know how to racism read. Racism, not well the, pro- the problem is when you look at a lot of these councils when they are doing stuff like that, you, you look at the focus that they put their effort into. It's not how can I bring business to the area? How can I improve the lives of the people, you know, uh, build leisure, slant, leisure centres? Build tracks, you know, uh, get so running tracks. Build sport, sporting grounds and upgrade them and get kids into sport because it's good for the community. They don't do any of that. They're focused on ideology that's related to Marxism. And if you look at where has that come from, it's because some of these councils coming in come through the education system where they've been brainwashed and indoctrinated by Marxism and then they take that ideology to then push on local government that's not even designed as an apparatus to, to, to push that kind of agenda in the first place. But that's what we're seeing. And we're seeing them go completely off topic. Like the, the Sutherland Shire Mayor, he had a, he had a debate with uh, Labor and Greens councillors about um, putting, whether they were going to put up um, the rainbow flag for Pride Month. And he said to them, which flag are you going to take down? Because we've got three flags there already. Which flag are you going to take down to put up this flag? Are you going to take down the Australian flag, the Aboriginal flag, or the state flag? Which one are you going to do? Because I'm not putting up a new flag. I want to put a new flagpole. I want to do all these crazy things. They debated it, talked about all these different things. 
And then you have to ask yourself the question, what, hang on a minute, why is this even important? Actually, roads rate yeah. rubbish. Roads, roads rate, rate rubbish. rubbish. This is yeah. complete virtue signaling. signaling. It, it's absolutely distressing. Uh, I mean, you've got Waverley Council with a rainbow on their driveway, and my tax has paid for that too. Mm. Like I said yeah. previously, where's the heterosexual colour if <laughs> you don't identify with the rainbow? But it's just crazy. They should be taking out the rubbish. You're yeah. right. And there's they... an opportunity cost because every time you're not talking about that, when you should be doing competent stuff that you're being paid for. That's right. That's like right. You've this. got traffic jams everywhere. You, mm. You've got no infrastructure being built um, anywhere because you can't get out of certain areas because it's just a nightmare. Mm. But we're talking about which flags we want to put and, up. And look at the development stuff. Uh, if you look at some of the people who get involved in council, they get involved in council specifically because they want to be able to work with developers and get things passed sooner and change the whole rules of a council and all the laws and everything related to a council in order to get through their de development applications to put up high rises and do whatever they want to do, all for their own selfish profit, nothing to do with helping the community. And it's it's completely wrong. It's a lot of favour trading, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Mm. This, I mean, yeah. this is the upshot of a trend that's been taking place over the last forty years: the the, the decline of civic of social capital, the the, the decline of civic participation. Uh, you know, forty years ago, um, the numbers of people who were members of political parties was much much higher. The numbers of people who were members of trade unions and other sort of voluntary societies much higher. The numbers of people involved in um, uh, groups like the Boy Scouts, the Girl Guides, the Boys Brigade, the Girls Brigade, much, much higher. But what's happened over the last 40 years, life has become very busy. Tech, home technology has become much better. We've basically become more inward looking, less outward looking. And so there's been a vacuum of just ordinary people uh, being more civically conscious and filling that vacuum are the only kinds of people who have a, a strong bent to go into that. And that is ideological fanatics and so that's part of what has happened and so what we actually need and no one's got any answers in terms of how to generate it and it just might have to wait for things to get so bad that there's a huge motive for people to do this again we actually need a revival of just civic spirit mm. civic activism where people are out there doing things in their community um, in order to make sure that the community is running in a way that's sort of conducive to the character of the community and people are getting the things that they need and, and it's not being taken over by a group of fanatics with uh, delusions of grandeur that they're going to solve the problem over in the Middle East with um, a local council virtue signal on Palestine. These, these fanatics are also entrenched in the council and you can't get rid of them. I mean, look at City of Sydney. You, you just Clover Moore has been there for how long? Mm. And it and it's all about the green agenda and the LGBTQI agenda. What about, you know, other things like 30, 30 kilometres an hour that they I think the city of Sydney wants yeah. to introduce into into the area. Who who who's gonna want to the nightlife? Mm. Well, the nightlife the is nightlife. Is down the drain. It's dead. It's dead. dead. There's yeah. all these business owners are not um not getting any money. The people are not out. It's it's crazy. You know why I love Nigel Farage? Because he comes